Good Wednesday morning, and this talk that we're doing with John today is going to be in relation to a previous podcast where John had mentioned uh, kind of opening up and talking a bit about how he structures his talks in university when he was teaching. And so John's going to dive into that right now. Well, good morning, folks. Uh, good morning for me anyway. Uh, who knows what hour of the day or night you're listening. There isn't a lot of correspondence from podcasts, but line that I had about talking about how a structure of talk did provoke some comments, several, uh, saying, please, more. So here's the more. Uh, one of them was lovely. Um, I'm sure uh, he won't mind at all me telling a story. I'll keep him anonymous. Not that it matters, but he's the son of a family I've known for many years from uh, Deer Valley and IS CMDA talks. And uh, uh, when he was quite a little boy, he heard me talk my way through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which takes about an hour. He thought that was so cool that he decided to learn the Sermon on the Mount himself. And he did about age eight, and his mum uh, recorded it and sent it to me. And it, it was it was really lovely. I still have it somewhere because he, he does what little boys of that age who achieve something do. That they're, they're frightened they're going to lose it, that the, the memory will fail him. So he's speeding up all the way through. But he, he, he does it. He nails it. He's got three chapters of Matthew down. Uh, and he clearly has some understanding of what's going on right way back then and what's happened subsequently with his Christian life is evidence of that because unlike me, he didn't lose his way at university. He, he did the exact opposite. And there were a couple of others too. So the first thing uh, I need to do is repent and apologize because when I said how I structured talks, that's missed the most important point of all. I don't structure them in, in the sense of uh, getting a title and working away at it. These things get dumped in my lap, and it's very clear to me very quickly that this is something I should be able to talk about or ought to be talking about, and I'm not. Mm. So there's a bit of sometimes guilt, but more often, wow, what, what's this going to turn into? That's very different from having to teach a course that has a rigid curriculum that is boring as heck, uh, which would be introductory biochemistry for medical students, which is the ultimate definition of a waste of time, um, because you're told almost exactly what you have to do. So they could read it from the book. They have very good short-term memories, but it's very short-term. You're not doing anything of permanent significance. Most doctors know virtually no biochemistry. Uh, and if they do know it, it's not because they learned it in undergraduate medical school. Um, over the years, I, I gradually worked my way towards the way I do things now uh, with considerable help from Wendell Berry and Peter Kraft and others who I thought approached it the right way. I mean, Peter Crave's teaching of philosophy at Boston College, uh, basically by bringing so Socrates to life. He, he does a Socratic dialogue for a lot of his stuff, and he, he writes his books in dialogue, and they're well worth studying. Between Heaven and Hell, I think, is uh, any of you listening who, who are sort of vaguely aware that Christianity might be more important than you would like it to be, and those of you who are Christian and have friends who you know really would enjoy what you've got, but you don't know how to get to them, Peter Kreis' little book, Between Heaven and Hell, is probably the starting point, except that it's out of print at the moment. At least we couldn't find any copies when we were looking for some the other day. IVP, I think, is the publisher, so I haven't yet chased them up. But uh, he told me that it was a gift. It illustrates the thing I'm talking about, how how these things can happen. And he just happened to notice that C.S. Lewis, Aldous Huxley, and Jack Kennedy all died on the same day. And then he had the brilliant idea, and who knows where our ideas come from, uh, the good Lord frequently, I think. But he had the brilliant idea that he could bring them together in limbo, hence between heaven and hell, to discuss the meaning of life, because... Lewis is probably the most acceptable small-O Orthodox Christian worldwide. He 
manages to straddle an immense space. Uh, Aldous Huxley was an, was an atheist, and Jack Kennedy was anything but a Roman Catholic. Uh, he was a liberal uh, of the first order and amoral as well. So they make an interesting take on the world. Huxley realized the importance of the narrative that we inhabit. Kennedy who didn't, and Lewis who knew what it was. So it begins, where the hell are we, says Kennedy. And Lewis says, not there, I trust, doesn't smell like that. And they begin to open up a discussion. And I won't spoil it for you, but seeing Lewis uh, take Kennedy down in, in very stra very interesting and clever ways and make him think about things he thought he knew. It's lovely. Yeah, most people read it at a sitting. It's it's not long. It can be read in two and a half hours. Uh, but it's a wonderful introduction to why you should think about faith. I mentioned it to a friend in church, and he said, oh, I should look at that. And he said, I couldn't. Before I went and got a copy, I, I looked for some reviews. And he said, uh, I found two that said exactly the same as you did, that once you pick it up, you'll sit there and read it till you finish it, which most people don't do with books. It grabs you in that sense, and it's short enough for you to know that you can do it. So it's a, an afternoon read when you've got an afternoon that you can waste in one way or another. This won't be a waste. And uh, it starts people off on a journey, just as Lewis himself started off. A wonderful little book uh, to get started with. Uh, but the gift came from nowhere. He juxtaposed those things. Uh, our lives are not accidental, and the older you get, the more you become aware of it. I mean, one of my colleagues at Augustine College, John Robson, our friendship would not have blossomed in the way it did. If I hadn't bought a Saturday morning newspaper in Ottawa, uh, which I very, very rarely did, uh, because he'd written an opinion piece which which was the most, one of the most brilliant uh, descriptions of why you need to think about the history of the Western world for, and involve Christianity. I mean, the opening line is, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean at the time of Christ was not an ignorant backwater. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but where uh, Greek philosophy met Roman pragmatism and Jewish theology, some fishermen, a tax collector, and a man who had a seizure on the road to Damascus persuaded their neighbors and then the whole Roman Empire that a dead Jewish carpenter was God. How weird is that? Now, that's the kind of introduction that can grab attention, and it does. It took a long while for it to work out in his life before he reached the end of that particular road, and that's usual. The, the more capable you are intellectually, the longer the journey to get to Christ usually is. In John Wesley would be a classic example. He thought he was a Christian, did everything right, visited the poor, uh, went into the prisons, uh, ran a Bible study at Oxford, etc., etc., became a missionary, and at the same time he was a pain in the backside because he wasn't actually a Christian. And uh, he was a missionary to, I think, Georgia or somewhere like that. And they threw him out. They couldn't stand him because he was a prig. Uh, sent him back to England. And he gets back to England and uh, because he's an Anglican minister and three men are going to be executed and they can't find a priest. So he, he tells those three men what he believes to be the truth about sin, salvation, and consequence. And they believed it. And they repented. They died easily. And he said, he wrote in his journal, I can save others, but who will save me? And he had to be humbled. So his brother uh, was exploring London and found a little uh, Moravian uh, church in the back streets of London where the Holy Spirit was at work. And he went and said to John, you have to come to this church with me. Well, John had just been to even song at St. Paul's, beautifully done. And he, I can almost hear him saying it in a snobbish English voice, you know. What have those people to teach me? But 
Charles persuaded him. And then he wrote in his journal later that it was it wasn't even the Bible. It was a man reading Luther's introduction to the Book of Romans in with a thick German accent. Nothing beautiful about it. But suddenly he was touched, he said, and I knew for the first time that I was a child of God. And that changed the history of Britain along with Whitfield. I love those kinds of stories. I collect them because I want to be continuously reminded that we have no idea what we're doing at the deepest level. But if we're paying attention, we'll find ourselves in places where we see what God is doing as an onlooker, and that that is wonderful. So the way uh, I s structure the talks is to try and be observant as to what's being pushed in front of me, hopefully by the Holy Spirit, or by the world at large when it's getting it badly wrong, and then thinking, can I talk about that in a way that might be helpful to people and interesting? And if it's important, it will come to me slowly. So uh, I haven't gone looking for what I do now. It, it came to me, if you like. Um, I think I've said on this podcast, I try and say regularly to remind people that this is the truth. I was not an active, visible Christian in the university until my mid-40s. Uh, I never ceased to believe the story was true, but that didn't make me a Christian in the lively sense. Um, I was smart enough to, to realize that in the early church, thousands of people gave their lives rather than deny Christ, and all they had to do to avoid it was drop a pinch of incense into an a flame and worship the emperor, and they wouldn't do it. Uh, and they were executed brutally. They took their friends with their children with them into the arena rather than leaving them to be brought up as slaves in a pagan world. Now, you don't do that if you know the story is false. You do it because you know the story is true. Uh, they we're talking about a period where there was still an oral family memory memory of people who had seen Christ after the resurrection. For years I wondered why Christ I could see coming to the disciples and uh, the near friends, but he, he spoke to several hundred. Several hundred people saw him after the resurrection. And of course, what that meant in a world whose population was a fraction of where it is now, and the Jews were then going to be spread all over a mere 30 years later, all over the Mediterranean. It meant there was an oral memory of the truth of this story. So if somebody was trying to be a clever academic back then and say, well, it's all really a myth so that people have made up for their own comfort, somebody in the audience would shout, oh, no, it's not. My whatever, great-great-grandfather, our family knows very well. Our family knows the story because our family saw Jesus after the resurrection. So... Tom Wright pointed out somewhere that there are no real uh, attacks on the idea of the resurrection for uh, 150 years after Christ uh, dis died. Uh, they wanted it to dilute out because if they tried it before that, it wouldn't work and it probably lasts even longer than that. A memory like that will be kept going in a family for quite a long while, several generations. So... Uh, the way that we need to talk about these things has got to be rooted in reality. And I say my reality was that I knew the story was true, but it, and I listened to good preachers. I, I, I liked I liked a good sermon. Uh, I liked that seriousness, especially uh, when I had the privilege of listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones or John Stott, who, both of whom were superb preachers in very different styles. The, the turning point for me was marriage, really. My, my wife shouldn't have married me, but she did. Uh, we'd known one another on and off for seven years before she rescued me from going totally astray. So whatever she does, I will never be able to repay her adequately. So she's got a free pass. But once uh, my wedding service, I didn't know there was going to be a sermon, and the sermon was actually that no man setting out to build a tower doesn't first find out whether he's got enough bricks. And the vicar was looking at me saying, I don't think you've got enough bricks for this marriage project. 
And of course he was right. And that took me back to church, uh, us back to church. And we were blessed in many ways along that route. Um, but it stayed very private. I wanted my children to grow up as I did, and I realized they wouldn't because my parents had an active faith and I didn't. But we did the best we could, and we've been blessed. But I was got out from all sorts of stages in my uh, early 40s, uh, all sorts of directions. Little prods came along. Uh, one of the important ones, there were at least half a dozen of them, but one of the important ones was meeting uh, an InterVarsity Christian Fellowship regional organizer at a cocktail party in Ottawa. Uh, he was a Brit who'd got an undergraduate degree from Oxford and uh, immediately started working for IV and did so for years. And I was talking to him, and, uh, a cocktail type talk, and I said, well, yeah, I went to InterVarsity uh, occasionally after uh, beginning in the university, but uh, most of the time uh, it was, I didn't like it that much. Only when they had a really good speaker did I, I go along. But anyway, it doesn't lead to getting through medical school with your faith intact with a very high proportion anyway. I did go to a little Bible study in the medical school, and uh, the dozen or so people that would turn up there, uh, for a long while I only knew one other who was a Christian later on, so... It's not doing a very good job of producing long-term Christians. He didn't get mad with me. We went our different ways. But a few months later, he asked me to do his annual fundraising banquet talk. I said, you, you've got to be crazy. If I talk about what I talk to you about, then I go, that's not going to bring you any money. And he said, they need to hear what you've got to say, but um, try and be a little less cynical. I doubt that I was, but in the audience was a young man who'd just got into our medical school. And come September, he knocked on my door and said, are you actually Christian? And I said, it's a fair question. I believe the story is true, and I believe that therefore we owe loyalty to Christ and I acknowledge there's not much evidence of that in my life in the university. You'd have to come to my home to see that it does play an important role. And he said, well, I heard you give that talk for, uh, in Ottawa for John, uh, and there are four of us in first year who don't want to lose our faith. Will you help us? Grudgingly, I said yes, and said, you better come to my house at 8 o'clock in the evening, and we'll do four weeks of Bible study to try and help you integrate faith and practice. Well, that four weeks turned into 10 years. The only way you keep students at bay is by not knowing them. Uh, once you know them, you start to care about them, and then they wreck your life, basically. Well, not wreck it, but they certainly change its direction. I never even learned the names of the, the fourth-year students that I taught in an honors biochemistry class. And I always made the first two lectures so bad that Anybody who was just looking for a grade left. Then I'd got decent students, and uh, we had a, an enjoyable time. And I still meet them occasionally, and I can apologize, and they laugh and say, it's fine. It's uh, Grace is good in that sense. So uh, then they dragged me into doing uh, speaking at conferences for Christian medical students. But the key one that illustrates what uh, I want to talk about in the way talks come about, was as these talks began to spread and I began to travel all over the States, uh, my wife reads all the emails and tells me which ones I have to do something about, uh, which might get done sometime in the next month. She said, I'm going to put your calendar on a website because people say... Uh, we would have gone to that talk if we'd known he was there because uh, Americans are amazing. They, they don't think it's crazy to drive eight, 80 miles to go to a talk in the evening. Uh, they will do that. So I laughed and said, well, nobody will go there. But of course, I was wrong. Uh, and shortly, uh, students would be obviously uh, bored in a lecture, would be surfing. And the first result from that, uh, 
website was students from Wayne State, Detroit, which is a dominantly black school. And they called me and said, we see you're going to Ann Arbor, you have to go through Detroit, will you talk to us as well? And uh, I said, sure, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, and they said, well, it will be January the 23rd, which is the date of the Roe v. Wade decision. And we want you to talk about abortion in the medical school in the middle of the day. And I said, no, don't do that. Um, and they said, why? And I said, no wish to be lynched in public. Uh, it's too con There's too much tension attached to it, too much emotion. But they said, we think you could do it. And I said, uh, flattery will get you nowhere. And then they got me the only way they could have done. They said, well, we've been praying about it, and we're sure you should do it. And I knew that this subject was in the background of my mind because I'd been, I'd facilitated abortions for, for rubella babies and the like in the past and felt no guilt at the time. Note that feeling's not very reliable. I was just solving a woman's problem when she was going to have a child with a major handicap. It's better to start again, was the way we dealt with it. And... Never had a woman who disagreed. Um, I hope they had good families after that, but I'm sure at some stage they will wonder about that baby. So I knew that I had different views, that they were firming up, so I had to try and do it. So you need that kind of build-up. Christians don't have to jump in with two feet whenever they come across a question they can't answer. The better thing to say is, well, I'm not sure I can answer that question very well. I'll need some time to think about that. Uh, I acknowledge it's a problem, but it, it's not a major problem. It, it doesn't undermine my faith that I haven't got an answer for that particular question. Uh, it's niggling away at me, and I guess uh, I will find out why in the not-too-distant future. And that's what happens, of course. About the same time, uh, I came across first things, courtesy of Graham Hunter, I think. Graham's very good at picking up these things. He said, "You like, there's a new journal. Uh, so I think I've got pretty well every copy since about number five. Um, and it was a level of serious connection with the world that I hadn't found in a periodical that was small o orthodoxly Christian, uh, utterly realistic and very sophisticated. Um, people writing were very talented. When I recommend people to look at uh, first things and think about reading it, uh, I usually tell them, look, don't think you'll read through this magazine the first time and understand it all, you won't. But if you labor away for a year or so, they will raise your standards and your vocabulary and you will get in further and further. You can always start by reading the uh, the editorial. It was by Newhouse when I started. It's Reno now, but the editorials are worth reading. Uh, there are short articles and long articles and book reviews and letters. Uh, and right at the end, they have a little set of snippets called... Uh, uh, while we're at it, in which they collect the nonsenses that are going on in the world simply because we've lost our Judeo-Christian culture. And those little snippets can start a conversation anywhere. And they start a conversation in your own mind as you realize you only have trivial responses, but then you'll see a book that will make a difference to you. You'll find an article that will make a difference. On my website, I have about, uh, in the the reading section, there are about six or seven articles from First Things, so that you only have to look at one magazine to get some material to start a reading group. Um, Jay Wojciechowski's uh, The Revenge of Conscience is in there. Uh, Jensen's uh, articles are there. I was interested that when they did a 25-year review and they, of the ones that really mattered, uh, five of them were on my list as well, so... But they've changed the way I think, and they've also well, given me a range of friends and colleagues that I would not otherwise have had. Um, 
And Newhouse was very, very aware of how important abortion was because of its deeply theological challenges that it has to face, if it's going to be honest, that Christians should sort of shrug and pretend, well, it's not our problem, we don't have to bother about it, which is what I did and what most people do. Um, Well, that won't do. And of course, in medicine, it won't do at all. So all that stuff was going on in the background already, so it was a bit like a hanging fruit. It's easy to pick at that level, but I still didn't have a clue how to deal with it uh, effectively. I'd, I'd seen that it usually degenerates into, you think that, I think that. You know, it goes nowhere. There's no movement. And then one afternoon, I couldn't settle to my work, uh, so I said to my postdoc and the technicians in the, uh, the lab, you carry on this afternoon. I'm going to my office. I'm going to shut the door and take the phone off the hook. Um, don't disturb me unless it's life or death. I sat down and asked myself, okay, uh, I know abortion is wrong. Why do I think that? And how would I start to put that together in a way that might help other people? And I started jotting things down. And by the end of the afternoon, I'd made a considerable progress. And I actually talked to Robert Spitzer about it, my Jesuit friend, and asked him, look, this is the way I think we should talk about this, but I, you're a Jesuit, tell me what's wrong with this talk, because I, I don't want to get into this can of worms, but I don't know anybody who's doing it this way. And he listened and he said, I think that's the way it should be done. You've got to do it. And so I did. The first time I gave the lecture, it ended in dead silence. And it wasn't because anybody was asleep. They just didn't know what to say. And it has ended that way every time since. I've I've never had a serious comeback from a pro-choicer because they hadn't thought about what I'm laying on their plate at the time. And they still haven't. And I mean, we're talking about over 20 years now. Now, the first thing to do when when this is laid on your plate is to make it part of your prayers and that's essential and then pay attention and see what happens and other things start to feed in Uh, one of the keys was Aquinas I don't know who introduced me to it it's likely to be Graham Hunter but I can't be sure Um, but Aquinas says somewhere and I couldn't tell you exactly chapter and verse that when you are making an argument, the first thing you should do is make your opponent's case for him and do it better than he can do it. That's my gloss. Because that causes them to relax. If you've got a pro-choice audience who are itching to tear you apart and you begin by telling them why they might be right and do it better than they can, they do relax, and that means you start to have the possibility of genuine engagement. And of course, for a physician, it's not difficult. Uh, there are quite a lot of physicians, uh, believing Catholics and evangelicals, who are not against abortion. That's going to diminish because uh, abortion is now available. But if you're my age, The abortions that you did see were backstreet abortions. And that is a horrible way to die. Because it's usually septicemia, uh, renal failure. It's horrible. shouldn't happen to a young person. So it's imprinted on your mind. And you don't ever want to see it again. So if a society is going to do abortion, and it is, it ought to be done in the safest possible way. Otherwise, you're going to have horrible deaths. And you can fill that in a bit. Now, they also insert at that point a little bit of a pushback, but only a little one. So it was never the numbers that we have now, because if it had been, uh, the, the 
the number of cases of acute renal failure following abortion would be huge, and they weren't. They never exceeded, once we got dialysis, they never exceeded the capacity of the dialysis programs for emergency dialysis to get through that. So the numbers were made up. And of course, many years later, Nathanson, who was the founder of the abortion movement, acknowledged uh, we made up the story of the coat hanger and we made up the statistics and nobody checked. There's no data. It was a lie uh, about the numbers. And eventually, uh, Nathanson was brought to face. Uh, his book, uh, The Hand of God, is a superb read on this subject. So I begin by saying, making their case. They're going to say, well, how are you going to get out of that one? Uh, because I am. Uh, because my intent is not to make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. But if it is going to be done, in a secular world where life has no meaning beyond this world, if we are a representative democracy and uh, a large number of people want it, then it has to be done properly and properly controlled. We can't be uh, stand in the way of a rational uh, pos political position that comes if you don't believe in God. We can say we think you're wrong and we should attempt to persuade uh, we should do everything we can in that area, and they will show themselves up for what they are by stopping us doing humanitarian things if they can, like caring for w women through their pregnancy and providing them with services, etc., etc. Um, that's just what should follow. But a secular society is going to do abortion, it's going to do euthanasia, and it'll go on doing it until it's horrified in some way or another. So you start by setting them up by asking appropriate questions. The next question to ask is uh, we've got to get from the purely physical facts to the fact that this is ultimately a moral discuss discussion. And I say I need to establish one other thing with this audience. What proportion of the people you live with do you really trust? How many people do you have in your life that you could leave $10,000 with them with no paper trail and come back any time in the next 20 years and it would be there? And you can see that there are many. I say to the medical students, you've probably only been in medical school a few months or at most a couple of years. What proportion of your class are trustworthy? Well, it used to be most of them, we think. Uh, now it's not. Trust has been dropping acutely. There are far too many people going into medicine with no good reason to be there. They look upon it as a secure uh, career, a license to print money if you move into the right area. And that's where it is. But that's not good, good news. We are undermining the moral basis of medicine, whereas the ancient Greeks, polytheistic pagans that they were, realized and we have now got to be so clever, we've forgotten it all, and we're going against it, that if you want to improve medicine in the days before you had effective treatment in the modern sense, you must cultivate trust. And the thing that the Hippocratic physicians did was say, well, we will promise never to kill anyone. Because in the ancient world, and in the pagan world to this day, and in our post-Christian world, Doctors are killing patients, and it's increasing. Canada is now the world leader in killing people at the end of their life. Uh, I'm sure that it's not been properly done and properly invigilated at all, but that's, that's where we're at. But you ought to know when you go to your doctor that he's not going to kill you, and that increases trust. People voted with their feet over the next few centuries because you went to the Hippocratic physicians, at least you'd come back alive in many cases. Now, there's no question that there's a conflict of interest with, with making doctors legally killers because money changes hands at the end of life and there are itchy palms waiting for Uncle George to die. And so if Uncle George is in hospital. There's a doctor there who might just be corruptible. And of course they are. 
everybody is, ultimately. Everybody has a price. Medicine, the ancient Greeks understood, is a moral activity. What you do is you help patients to decide what they ought to do. Now, you can't get a statement in the imperative sense from purely factual statements. Lewis makes that. That's the point of the abolition of man, is to convince you that that is true. Uh, and most beautifully done in the modern period by David Stove uh, in his Darwinian fairy tales to show that if you want morality, then you can't have a Darwinian world. If you have a Darwinian world, you don't have morality, not rational morality. So all this discussion goes on in the first little bit before you get to things. So, so what I want to try and do if I'm talking to medical students is I want to at least take the word bigot out of the conversation. Whenever it's used, almost invariably, it is the person who uses the word bigot who is in fact bigoted because they are refusing to seriously consider the alternative to their own position. That's Chesterton's definition of bigotry. It's a very good one. So in this issue, it's whenever anybody shouts bigotry, uh, they are practicing it themselves as well because there's a rational uh, grounds both for and against. And it depends not on physical facts, but on what you believe to be the truth about the human condition. We all want to be able to trust, but we don't want to consider what that involves. So at least I hope that you will agree in this medical school, if I'm talking to a medical school, to outlaw the use of the term bigotry in discussions of abortion, because it is intellectually indefensible. And usually they get the nod. And I said, let's go a little bit further along those lines. I want you to imagine that you have got before you a, a young woman who's pregnant with a very inconvenient pregnancy, and she's come asking for an abortion. And standing by uh, the bed is, shall we say, Mother Teresa, and Henry Morgenthaler or Nathanson before he became pro, pro-life, standard pro-choice representatives. Now, what do they see? Well, they're honest people, so both of them see lying on that bed two lives. Not one, two lives. No doctor is going to deny that what's in the uterus is a living creature with a human genome. If it was undisturbed, it would look something like you when it got to your age, and you look something like it when you were that age. So no doctor is going to deny that that is the truth. It is, you can't deny that that is the truth. And the best of the feminists, when they're arguing, they don't do it that way. They will give me immediately, they say, yes, the only place where we get our own individual DNA is obviously conception. But we don't want to talk about biology. We want, we want to talk about people. And you can see where this is going to go. Because if you're going to be rational and do an abortion, you do have a problem. You have to deny that this living creature does not have human rights. And yet we are a rights-based society, we say now. So Henry Morgenthaler and his ilk take a utilitarian view. We say, yeah, there's winners and losers, but the toss-up here is the best outcome is for the child because they move towards personhood defined as the capability of re- of relationship. Now, in utero, you have no relationships. So the unborn human being in the first eight months is a living human creature but incapable of relationship, they say, although that's not true. They bond with their mother's voice in utero. There's all sorts of arguments against it. But as a starter, so uh, the solution to the problem from the pro-choice point of view was uh, produced by Annette Bayer, I think her name was, a philosopher who said, we have got to pull apart human beings and human persons. Give the human being to the pro-life part. Yeah, you get your unique DNA at conception. Only a biological ignoramus would deny that. But 
what matters much more is human personhood. And we have to define personhood in terms of function. And you see what's going to happen now. This changes the whole story. But it, it isn't without consequences. Christian doctors have to acknowledge that backstreet abortion would in principle come back if we made it illegal. Um, and that would be awful. But that's the only barrier we carry, uh, the only burden we carry. But the other side hasn't thought about not only what they've done, but what the consequences are. So once you move to function, you're in a very different world and you walk to relationship. Uh, I mean, none of us live up to our parents' uh, hopes for us. So we carry some guilt at that level. Uh, at this level, there's some guilt attached to that. You know that your mum would love a grandchild. You're not even going to tell her in most cases that you're going to have an abortion. And you don't have to get parental permission even when you're age 12 in, in some parts of the world, parts of Canada. You change. Okay. This is not something that's intrinsic to you. Now, it's something you earn. You earn the right to be a human person if you can fulfill certain functions. So you can see what this is going to do. Okay, it gets you off the hook. The baby in the uterus has no relationships uh, it is neither happy nor unhappy. So any philosophy of happiness doesn't apply. And when it's snuffed out very quickly, uh, that's humane, and everybody can get on with their lives and have another go. That isn't all that's there. There's much more at stake. So you can see it was initially just the first 12 weeks, but that's a very arbitrary figure. And, of course, it just got pushed. The more money you have, the further it would be pushed. Uh in the end, uh, there was nothing stopping it, and uh, we got to partial birth abortions, where you could define an abortion as the killing of a human being before it exited the birth canal. And they actually pushed that to the point where you could have the baby's legs and arms moving outside the body, and they put a trocar in the back of the neck and pit it. And that was done, and is done in North America now. Not often, but it's done. And there's no logical reason why you wouldn't, given the definitions that the pro-choice world has foisted upon us. But it gets worse. What if you have a baby who will never be capable of relationship? Well, we're doing euthanasia for that too now. Uh, we're setting out to be as distant as we can. We are, we are currently trying to get rid of about 30 different metabolic diseases that are genetic that we can diagnose in utero and do an abortion early on. You have some sort of trauma during the birth process or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is, but you find you've got a baby that will never have an IQ over, shall we say, 70. That's a burden for life. You shouldn't have to carry that. So infanticide follows. You start with early abortion, you get to partial birth abortion. Now you've got to infanticide. Now, what if you're 18 and you get herpes encephalitis, which is, you can, it happens at that age group. You go to bed with an IQ of 150 and you wake up with an IQ of 80. That's not good news, is it? Now you have lost your function. Therefore, you're right to be. Uh, euthanasia has got to the stage now where people have been killed for chronic depression children are allowed to demand euthanasia when they have no idea what they're talking about that's where we've got to I call it the domino effect of Roe v. Wade and I probably should stop at that point because we've been talking far too long uh, I'll have to come back and go through the domino effect, because you can see what, what's happening. I'm doing a lot of reading at this stage. I'm starting to look at politics. For instance, down here in front of me, I've got the list between 1967 and 1973 of the 20 odd times that American states voted against abortion. Because at the, at the state level, they knew what the general population would and would not tolerate. They didn't want to touch it. It's not something that pro-life people are foisting. 
on the rest of the world. It's the rest of the world saying, I don't want the world as it is. I'm going to change it for what I deem to be better. And this one certainly hasn't turned out to be better. Um, the first time I came across, and I, I will finish with this bit, uh, a serious uh, discussion of what's going on here was published in uh, the Scandinavian literature in 1997, Acta Scandinavica Obstetrica Gynecological, volume 76, and it's an addendum. It's a, a special paper at the end. But they did a, look, a study of abortion and maternal mortality. And what they, they did was uh, they took pregnancies and looked at them prospectively and then afterwards, they could uh, look at the ones that ended up with abortion. They, this was a tail piece to uh, a study trying to work out what pre- and postnatal care was needed. And of course, if you do a prospective study in the Western world of women who volunteer and then their relationship falls apart, you will, dis you will study abortion as well. And they didn't realize what data they'd got initially, but of course, they did in the end. So they looked at what happened in the mother's life in the year after the abortion. And they just looked at these categories. Total mortality rate, natural death, accidents, suicide, and homicide. Just uh, five categories. And it turned out that you could set, if you set the number of events in the mum who had a baby at one, then you could have a risk ratio of how many events occurred per mother in the other category. And the figures are stunning. Even for natural deaths in the year after you have an aborted baby, your risk of dying is up 1.6 times. If you uh, look at total mortality, it's up 3.5 times. If you look at accidents, they're up 4.2 times. Suicide, 6.4. And homicide, they don't even put it up to the full figure, a 13.99, 14 times increase. Those are not small differences. Now, nobody's making statements about causality. But they are saying we now have when a woman who's pregnant has an abortion, she actually needs a lot more social services in the next year if we're going to avoid suicide, death and murder. Obviously, they come from backgrounds that are dysfunctional. Are we making those efforts? Does Planned Parenthood put a significant amount of its money into follow-up? No, it does not. Neither do we. That data has been around since 1997, nearly 30 years. And I'll leave that for you to stew on until next week. Uh, have a good week, if that's possible. Thank you, Dr. John, and thank you guys all for listening. We hope you guys have enjoyed this, and do feel free to reach out with questions and engage and ask John, uh, and you can find links to do that in the descriptions below, and we'll see you guys next week. Mm -hmm.